And as you find your seats, we want to get your Bibles out or your device, whatever you may have, and turn to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Uh, if you haven't been with us, we have been marching our way verse by verse through the gospel of Mark, and uh, we are finally reaching the halfway point. We're going to be done with Mark chapter 8 today. So uh, if you're going to find your place in your Bibles, Mark 8, we're going to be looking at verse 34 today. But before we get there, uh, I, I need to tell you guys a story, and I'm learning that most of my illustrations are actually embarrassing stories about myself or, or about something that my kids have done. And so I just hope you realize I've done a lot of dumb stuff, and I have like years worth of embarrassing stories to use as illustrations, so, so buckle up. When Jess and I were engaged, uh, she went to a a bridal show at this big convention center. And if you've never been to one, I, I have never been to one, but they try to sell you all sorts of goods and services, obviously, to help prepare for your special day. And we got offered at that show, we got offered a, a free three-day vacation in Mexico. All we had to do was sit through a presentation. You guys ever been there? Were you duped like we were duped? So we decided, we're like, we're gonna go... They said we didn't have to buy anything, so we're going to go. And we, we went, to this, went to this presentation, and this particular one happened to be about, like, cookware, pots and pans and, and glass bowls and all this kind of stuff. And you know how these things go. They're showing you, like, how excellent, like, these are, like, the Rolls Royce of pans, and they're showing you how you can cook stuff without oil. And we were all about that because we're, like, we don't like cleaning stuff. And so they're showing us how it all works. And then somewhere along the way, I don't know why, but they got out these teacups, and it was part of the set that they were trying to sell. And this guy put it on the ground and stood on top of the cup. And I, I don't know what happened to me in that presentation, but I'm like, I need that cup. <laughs> right? You're like, I don't know why, but I need that cup. And I need, those, I need those pans as well. And so we started, somewhere along the way, we began to be, be convinced that this stuff we actually needed. And we're like, hey, we got to get pa pots and pans as a, as a married couple anyways. We need everything, so we're just going to buy these. And then we got back to, you know, where you sit with a sales representative, and he's like marking off everything that you're going to buy, and he gives us the price, and it's like three grand. And I'm like, hold up, time out. No. <laughs> and by God's grace, the Holy Spirit intervened and stepped in just in time so we didn't waste like all the money we were going to pay for our honeymoon on a set of pots and pans. But I learned something that day about excellent marketing strategies, right? They offer you something that you want almost for free. And then they do the bait and switch to get you to buy something that you don't actually need, right? And I bring this up, honestly, because this is how some pastors and some churches treat the gospel as a sales pitch, right? They say, hey, all your, you're going to be healthy, you're going to be wealthy, you're going to be wise. All you have to do is follow Jesus. But the problem is that's not the way it lines up in Scripture. It doesn't line up that way according to Jesus, and specifically here in Mark chapter 8, because it describes what following Jesus actually means. And if Jesus was just meant to be a good salesperson, he was really, really bad at it. But the gospel isn't just a sales pitch. You want eternal life? All you have to do is deny yourself, take up your cross, march to your death, and follow me. Who's signing up for that? Who's buying that set of pots? This is what we've been looking at for the last few weeks. It's right after Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus tells him, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father who is in heaven. And after that, Jesus begins to explain what that confession actually means. And last week, Evan, Pastor Evan did a great job showing us the cost of discipleship. He says, following Jesus actually requires total self-denial, complete submission, an exclusive allegiance to him. Who would buy that? You ever thought about that, how crazy it is for these disciples to keep following Jesus? We have, 
we have the blessing of being able to read all of Scripture and see what happens. But for them, they're following Jesus to his literal death and eventually their literal deaths. But this is the countercultural way of a Jesus follower. It isn't about us buying a better life. It isn't about all of our dreams coming true. It isn't about having like a, a genie like God in a bottle that we can get to do whatever we want and bless every part of our life. It's actually way, way, way better than that. And today I want to I wanna look and, at how Jesus continues in this section because here today he actually gets to the why. The why should I deny myself? Why should I take up my cross? Why should I follow you? Why should anyone consider this way of life? And I'd like to suggest to you that, that following Jesus, while it is countercultural and while it is difficult, is, is both reasonable and logical. And here's why. Here's our sermon in a sentence, kind of a big idea for today. Denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Jesus is costly, but it is the only way. This really shouldn't come as a surprise to us because theologically we know and we've been taught that following Jesus is the only way. Jesus said it himself. In fact, he said in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. It also shouldn't come as a surprise to us that this is reasonable. This, this life-altering change of course, denying ourselves, picking up our cross, and following Jesus, that's reasonable. Paul even stated it in Scripture, that it's a reasonable act of worship. I'm sure you're familiar with this passage, Romans 12. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And that word spiritual could actually be translated reasonable. See, it's, it's reasonable for those who know what Christ has done for them to lay down our lives in his care. But we have to remember, again, that we have the benefit of living on this side of the cross. The disciples didn't. This would have sounded crazy to them. When Jesus would have said, deny yourself, pick up your cross, they know what the cross is. They know that it's the most gruesome form of ex execution that the, the Romans had at their disposal. And they've seen hundreds, if not thousands of people march to their death with that, that cross beam on their shoulder to be crucified and killed. And for Jesus to say, you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, for the disciples, it's crazy. And so... Jesus, being the gracious teacher that he is, presents to them, and he presents to us, I think, three truths to help us understand the way of Jesus, to help us understand why we should deny ourselves, why we should bear a cross, and why it's on, the only way to eternal life. So let's dig into the passage together. Mark chapter 8, we're going to pick it up in verse 34. It says this, in calling the crowd to himself with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous in a sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Hopefully, as you heard that or as you looked at the screen and read it or looked in your own Bible, you picked up on some repeated words. And it's important for us to know that as we read the word of God, it's not an accident when they repeat a word. So two phrases and two questions in this section start with the word for. And in Greek, the, the original language, that word can also mean because. So essentially, Jesus is saying, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me, because. Here's the why behind what we're doing. I think he lays out for us three truths or three reasons for this type of dedication to Jesus. So number one, truth number one, 
In verse 35, it says, there is no way for us to save our own souls. There is no way for us to save our own souls. It says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And here there, there's an important conversation about language that needs to be had, okay? Because the same word that, sa- that I just read that says life is also translated soul in the coming verses. So in Greek, in the Greek language, which is the language that the original scripture were written in, the New Testament was written in, there's actually three words used for life, what we call life. The first one is bios. And that's the word where we get the, our idea of biology. It's, it's physical life. So I'm like my arms and my legs, my, my body, my, the physical creation, the, the plants, the trees, the grass, life, bios. That's what life is. And then there's the word here, it's suke, which means soul. Suke, it's it's the spiritual life that all of us, because we're created in the image of God, we all have a spiritual part to us. Our our bodies eventually will, will die and decay, but our souls will live in one of two places for all of eternity. As Christians, we believe that the soul will go on in either heaven or in a very real place called hell. That's the, the soul, the life, the suke that he's talking about. And the last one is zoe, which means eternal life. It's actually the word we get zoo from. But zoe is this, this life that goes beyond the grave. And again, one of two places. And so all throughout scripture, God uses these three different words to show us that, yes, we have physical life. He created us with bodies. Yes, we have spiritual life, and one day we will have eternal life in either place. And right now, when Jesus is speaking, he's talking about suke, the the soul, the spiritual side of your life. And he says that those who try to save this life, their, their soul, on their own, by their own means, if we try to do that, we'll actually end up losing our soul, losing our life. So the question is, how do we try to do that sometimes? How do we try to save our own lives? And I can tell you in this generation, in this context, these people, a lot of them would try to to save their own souls by earning their way to God, by earning God's favor. We talk about the Pharisees often and how they created a system of rules that even protected the rules and commands that God gave. And so if they could just be good enough at keeping the rules and keeping God's written commands, then they could earn God's favor. They would say, if, if I can pray enough and I, if I can pray in just the right way, if I can keep myself clean, if I wash my hands at all the right times and keep my body free from contaminants, if I fast enough, if I give up food enough, if I give enough money, If I do enough good things, then, then I will be in right standing with God. But time after time, Jesus confronts the mentality and even rebukes those that practice this self-righteousness, this righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders. In fact, he goes so far as to say that there's actually only one person who is good. In Matthew 19, He answers this exact question. He says, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? He said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. See, we try to save our souls by doing the right thing. In fact, entire religions are dedicated to this type of format. They're trying to save their own souls, to do enough good. But the Bible tells us that even our good works, the best things that we can do are as filthy rags before God. They are nothing. And Jesus says that these people that try to save their own souls, try to save their own lives, will actually end up losing them because they will end up serving something that is wholly not God. They actually will spend a lifetime serving themselves. I know that this is easy to think that this is a problem of the past, right? But it's not. Think about it when maybe you've had a really rough week. Dishwasher goes down. Microwave doesn't work. Refrigerator smells like old cheese. 
go out to the car and try to start the car. The car won't start. The kids are, are being a mess. And you're just like, what do, you, what do you begin to ask yourself? What did I do? Right? Like, what did I possibly do? I, I know I've been in a situation where if things are going wrong, I'm like, okay, is there, and did I mess up the formula here? Did I do something wrong that God's now like punishing me and allowing these things into my life? And so now I need to do more good things in order for my life to go the right way. We all do the self-righteous thing sometimes and try to earn favor with God. And maybe you believe the gospel, but now, now you want to earn what God did for you. You ever been there? Where you're like, I, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I believe his blood washes me clean, but now I need to spend my life earning what he did for me. That's exactly what he's talking about we are trying to live and save our lives by our own merit, Jesus says, you can't do it. And you may not say it, and you may not think it, but you and I can both try to save our own soul, or at least prove that our souls are worth saving. But Jesus says, those who try to save their soul, save their life, will actually end up losing it. Trying to impress God with our good works is like trying to impress Martha Stewart with a meal from an Easy Bake oven or trying to impress Bill Gates with a dollar bill. It's not possible. You and I cannot do enough good things to earn our way to heaven. It's only by the blood of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus alone. Jesus tells us whoever loses his life, though, whoever gives up his life, denies himself, he Whoever takes up his cross and follows Jesus for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of the gospel, gospel, those are the people who actually have saved souls. They gain life by giving it up. It's this weird exchange that in order to gain what is most important, we must give up what we think is most important, and that's our lives. See, the, the God's kingdom is upside down and backwards according to our flesh. It doesn't make sense. And things will often seem off. It doesn't make sense that I should give up my life to gain it. But just like the king of the world isn't supposed to die, life is found when we actually give it up. The truth is we can do nothing, literally nothing to save our own souls. You and I can't earn it. So the way of Jesus is the only way. That's not where Jesus stops. He goes on to tell us another reason why we should deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow him. Truth number two, there's nothing in this world worth the price of our souls. This is in verse 36 and 37. Again, he says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? You'll notice that this is actually two of the four, for or because statements, and I believe they, they fit together. The first one, what does it profit to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? This speaks to the idea of materialism. Friends, we care way too much about our stuff. We care about the houses we own. We want them to look a certain way and impress a certain way. We care about the cars we drive and, and how nice they look or how new they are. We care about the places we eat. It's not just enough to have food uh, in our refrigerators. We want really good food. We care too much about the things that we drink. I personally am guilty of this. I'm a coffee snob. Guys, there's no good coffee in Boulder City. It's a problem. But we care too much about accumulating more and more stuff. We care too much about how people, how much people are impressed with us. We care too much about the pleasures of this world. And guys, people who own grocery stores like, like Walmart, they, they know this about us, that we just want more and more and more. Every time that I go, I often get to do the grocery shopping for our family, and I'll go through the grocery store and get all the things we need, and you, you get up to... Uh, the, the checkout lane, and they always have more junk right there. And some of you are like, I never need that. But just like that cup that that guy stood on, I'm like, I, I kind of think I do need that. 
Or there's like a, there's a case of soda there and I, I want to pick one out and, and drink it on the way home. Or there's a candy bar that I want right there. We just are constantly wanting more and more and more and more and more. But if you had every single one of those things, would it be enough? Would it equate to the cost of your soul? Seriously, if at this moment you had everything you ever wanted, would it be worth it? Would it be worth your soul? Jesus says no. And it's a rhetorical question. He asks, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And it's needless to answer because it doesn't profit. It doesn't profit us to chase these things, to chase the American dream. Not that things are bad. God created this wonderful world for us to live in and to enjoy. But if accumulating those things is our focus or our soul desire, our life's goal, then our, we are chasing something that is absolutely worthless. This week I, I wanted to look up how much the earth is worth. You guys have any idea? Some smart guys got together and they actually decided and came up with a number, a price tag, if you will, for the price of just the earth. You guys want to know what that number is? Five quadrillion dollars. Do you know how much money that is? I don't even, this number doesn't even make sense to me. That's a five followed by 15 zeros. So everything in the world, all the land, all the cars, all the houses, all the kingdoms, everything. Jesus says here that if you had all of it, if you were king of the earth, it wouldn't be worth your soul. It's not worth it. Your eternity is far more valuable than anything this world has to offer. So stop chasing what we can simply put our hands on and, and strive to for the things that God says are important, namely a relationship with him, with his son, Jesus. The second part of this section seems like repetition, but it's, it's worth mentioning. He repeats himself a little bit in verse 37. He says, for what can a man give in return for his soul? If you lose your soul, it means what can you give to get it back? And this should cause us to pause and think for a minute because we may be chasing the things of this world so hard that we forfeited our, our very souls. And Jesus is saying, if that happens, there's nothing so valuable that you can give in return to get it back. I mean, there's no earthly equivalent for the human soul. Nothing is worth it. For those listening here with the disciples, this would have had huge religious implications because I don't think they would actually be thinking about money because they've been told their whole lives that, that money is not a part of what we need to seek but they would have thought of what works can I do to keep my soul what good thing can I do in order to keep my soul how can I retain my soul or save it and the, the answer is there, there's nothing the only thing that you and I can do to keep our souls is to trust in Jesus. Meaning that we are entrusting to him the care of our souls, the care of our life, and it's up to him to keep it. And thank God he has not failed yet and he won't fail in the future. He is a perfect savior, a perfect king, a perfect keeper of our souls but Jesus has one more reason that he, he gives for why we should deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. And I think this one, honestly, is, is the most convincing for me. Truth number three, there are eternal consequences for denying Christ. There are eternal consequences for denying Christ. It says in verse 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And when I read this verse, my, my eyes and my mind goes immediately to that word, ashamed. What does it mean that Jesus would be ashamed of us? And notice that he, he says, 
ashamed of me and my words. He doesn't remove himself from his words. Pastor Tom McCormick in Las Vegas said that, that there are many people who would love a Savior, but there are few that want to obey his words well. So what does shame mean? What does it mean that he would be ashamed of us? Or what does it mean for us to be ashamed of him? When I think of shame, I think of uh, my kids, and I think of when we go to see them at school. Two of them currently at age six and at age eight are excited to see mom and dad at school. And they will run up and give, give me a hug, right? And give Jess a hug. But our fifth grader pretends like he doesn't know us, right? So he's gotten to an age where he wants to look and, and feel cool and impress his friends. And so I love what Jess does. She does not care. And so she goes up and embarrasses him anyways and gives him a big old bear hug. He's ashamed at that moment, okay? Is that what Jesus is talking about? If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. I don't think so because there's, there's, there's moments in our lives, right, where each one of us is ashamed of Jesus. We don't always stand like we're supposed to. So like when Peter denied Jesus, does that mean that, that Jesus was going to be ashamed of him? I don't think so. In fact, he restores him to a place of leadership in the church because this, isn't, this shame isn't a loss of salvation issue. It's when Jesus is speaking here, this is a never had salvation issue. And here, Jesus is specifically talking about the words he just spoke. He says, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. If you're ashamed of that, I will be ashamed of you. In other words, Jesus is saying, choose who you will deny, yourself or Jesus. Jesus is saying that in, in, instead of denying myself, being ashamed of him means that I deny him. Instead of dying to self, being ashamed of him means that I live for myself. Instead of following Jesus, being ashamed of him isn't simply not following him well. It means that I turn my back on him. See, when we are ashamed of Jesus, when we deny him, we leave him no choice but to be ashamed and deny us. This passage here that he's talking about when it says, returns in the glory of the Father with all the angels, it's referring to Jesus' second coming. That means that the way we respond to Jesus now echoes for eternity. The way you respond to Jesus can determine where you spend eternity. And if we choose to deny him now in this life, he will deny us forever. And I know that I'm not you, but these three reasons seem like pretty convincing reasons that why we should deny ourselves, pick up our cross daily, and follow him. So let's review. Truth number one, there is, there's no way for us to save our souls. Number two, there, there's nothing in this world that's worth the price of our souls. And number three, there are eternal consequences for denying Jesus Christ. So the question then becomes, what do you do with this? What do you and I, what's the invitation for us here in Boulder City in 2023? And honestly, the invitation is a paradox because he calls us to abundant life, but he also calls us to come and die. He calls us to come and die, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to, to march to our own death the death of what we want, the death of what we think we need, the death of the path we thought we had for our lives and to take up his. But he also says, come, I come, that you may have life to the full and have it abundantly. So which is it? Come and die or have abundant life? I'd like to suggest, and the word of God suggests, that it's actually both. Meaning that what Christ has to offer you is so much better than anything we can conceive on our own. So when we actually come and we deny ourselves and pick up our cross, we actually find life for the first time. And it's abundant life. It's a life that God designed for us to have. 
And that means that the invitation at the end of a message like this, when we read the word of God, is to evaluate. Are you actually following Jesus? I love what Jim Elliott says. He says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Yes, you will have to give up your life. You will have to give up what you think you want, your will, your way, but you will gain eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So for those of us who, who call ourselves believers, who call ourselves Christians, we must evaluate. Take a moment and we must evaluate if we have been following Jesus or if we've been following some God of our own making. It is possible for us to be here today in church and to have served the church and to be part of the church and actually have no relationship with God at all. Meaning you, you may have done exactly what the Pharisees did to save their own souls and yet have nothing to show for it. You may be trying to pile up all the good things that you've done or all the service that you've done to, to the body of Christ. You may be trying to say, God, I lived a, a, I lived a righteous life and God says, you can't do anything to save your soul. Only I can do that. So you must ask yourself the question and, and humbly ask yourself, are you actually a part of the family of God? Are you actually one of his children or have you just been worshiping a God of your own making? And maybe Jesus isn't Lord of your life. He's just some nice sentiment, a break from reality on Sundays. But have you made him Lord? Because he will be nothing less than Lord and Savior. For those of you who don't consider yourselves Christians, and maybe you're just here because someone invited you, and you want to be nice, or maybe you're here because your family dra dragged you along with them, I invite you this morning to count the cost. Yes, following Jesus will cost you something. But I also invite you to consider the alternative. Because whether you believe in him or not, Jesus is returning, and you and I need to make ourselves ready for his return. So the question for you is, are you ready for Jesus to return in glory with all the angels? And if not, we can take care of, you can take care of that today. I would love nothing more than to show you how you can have a rela saving relationship with Jesus that will last for eternity. Jesus has not been unclear about what it means to follow him. And it's not a sales pitch. It's not him trying to sell you a, a bag of goods. But he does give his reasons. And they are logical and they are reasonable. I want to end our, our time by just simply reading through the passage again. And for a moment, I want you to even maybe close your eyes and just think about these words. And think about if you actually are following Jesus this Jesus. It says again, Mark 8, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's pray. Father God, would you help us to evaluate carefully who and what we follow? Because God, you made it clear that the, the, the path to life is only through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself said, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So today, God, I pray that you would, you would grant us the humility it takes to actually evaluate our lives, to not walk out of here the same, but to look deep and say, God, am I, am I actually a, a child of yours? Am I actually a follower of Jesus? And then, Lord, I pray that you would bring conviction and the Holy Spirit would make it clear that today would be the day of salvation for many because we rightly see you, we rightly see your truth, and we see that Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And so God, bring life today. As we deny ourselves, as we pick up our crosses and walk behind you, give us abundant life as you promised, Lord. 
We pray this in your son's name. Amen.